Welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us in our second talk of this of our uh, threat briefing seminar series. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to reiterate what the why behind this lecture series. I know sometimes it can be a challenge to understand or track how your work fits into the larger picture of the lab and uh, and the nation and the world, but our mission is critical. Uh, it's critically important to the nation and that we partner and with our colleagues and friends across the enterprise uh, to deliver a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. And doing this is no small feat. Uh, each of you has an important role in delivering this deterrent, and this is a particularly challenging time for deterrence. We are trying to meet the needs of the nation while and understand the threats that we are facing and engaging across the lab to work to deliver this capability. We organized this seminar series to help us all better understand how our work plugs in to the, to the broader national security enterprise. Uh, and to the end, we're really excited to also have participation from colleagues at uh, Kansas City and Y12. Welcome and thank you for joining us. The whatever brings you here today, we are really thankful that you took the time out of your day to to join us and to continue this conversation. We hope you ask questions of Greg. We are so happy that he's here. Uh, uh, Brad will give a proper introduction, but I worked with Greg the first time. I guess it was now five years ago when I did a detail. He was a detail he out to Washington uh, for the the previous NPR. And I am a big fan of Greg's, and he really can help bring the context in which we're working, talk about this 2022 nuclear posture review, and help us better understand how to support the needs of our nation. So please uh, thank you for being here, and please take time to ask questions. And um, thank you. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Brad, over to you. Thanks, Ashley, for those opening remarks and for the partnership in putting together this series. Uh, and it's it's my pleasure to chair today's session. Uh, as many of you will understand, this is a follow on to the session we did uh, about three weeks ago uh, in which uh, I was asked to try and uh, link changes in the security environment to some implications for the deterrence challenges facing the nation and facing the laboratory. Uh, and as we conceive this series, uh, the next step in the process was to better understand the way in which these changes in the security environment and deterrence environment have been filtered through the policy and posture review process uh, and um, uh, where they fit into the, the, the changing national perspectives on our strategies for dealing with these problems. Uh, and this is an awkward moment to pose these questions because the administration has not yet released the unclassified versions of its nuclear post review and defense strategy review and and the like. But a lot is on the record in 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 uh, congressional testimony and fact sheets issued by the administration. Uh, so there's plenty to talk about. And to get started on this conversation today, uh, we. We're pleased to welcome Greg Weaver. Um, Greg is, uh, as you've all read his bio, but to reiterate the highlights, he's a recently retired deputy director from, for St strategic stability uh, in the Directorate for Strategic Plans and Policy, that's the J5, in the office of the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, in that role, he was responsible for the formulation of joint staff positions and recommendations regarding strategic deterrence and nuclear policy, as well as Department of Defense efforts to combat WMD and to negotiate and control uh, international strategic agreements. Uh, prior to joining the joint staff, he served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and also for a long time at Strategic Command. You have the full bio in front of you. Uh, Greg intends to speak for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes to set some opening arguments on the table for us. Uh, then this will be a conversation. We'll have a good 45 minutes for Q&A. Um, please uh, think of questions or comments you'd like to put into discussion and uh, 
don't wait until we we uh, get to that session to to um, put them into play. You can either use the chat function to do so, sending them to me, uh, or um, uh, raise your hand electronically, and I'll call on you to join the conversation. That's that's preferable, so we can really have a conversation. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for making the time to to do this with us today. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. Over to you. Thanks, Brad. Um, so uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, so I appreciate it. I thank both Livermore and Brad and Ashley for inviting me to share my personal thoughts and insights with you today. Having recently retired from full time federal service, uh, you'll be getting the full brunt of my personal views. I don't have to speak for the chairman anymore. Um, so I do think it's an inspired idea to make sure that the technical professionals at the lab in a deeper understanding of the political military situation that we face today and tomorrow, I think more importantly tomorrow, and how that relates to the technical work of the DOE nuclear weapons complex. So following up on Dr. Roberts' last comprehensive presentation to you several weeks ago, I thought I would hone in on the recently complete, completed nuclear posture review, the 2022 nuclear posture review, and provide you my assessment of the extent to which it addresses the rapidly worsening security environment we and our allies face. Uh, I'm going to go into a fair amount of detail about that worsening security environment and what it may mean for our future nuclear strategy and nuclear force requirements. Uh, of course, I'll be constrained by the unclassified setting we're in, but I'm going to give it to you as straight as I can uh, and in as much relevant detail as I can at the unclassified level. Uh, and then I'm going to address what I believe are the implications of this rapidly evolving threat environment for the DOE nuclear enterprise and for the lab Livermore itself. Uh, I'm not gonna sugarcoat the situation that we in the United States and you in the DOE nuclear enterprise face. Uh, in my opinion, it's somewhat dire and it calls for urgent action and change. Uh, so let me start with a brief overview of the recently concluded nuclear posture review, constrained a little bit by the fact that um, the actual unclassified version of that review hasn't been released yet. So I'm going to constrain myself to the things that have been announced. Um, throughout the 2022 NPR, uh, as Brad noted, I was the joint staff representative on the nuclear posture review working group, the group that did the bulk of the work on the review. And to give you some context for that, um, we met for four hours a week, half a day a week, uh, every five months working on this with lots of work in between those meetings, both preparing for the meetings and then digesting the result of the previous meeting. Um, the NPR in 2022 was structured in essentially the same way that the 2018 review was structured. Uh, and it basically took place in three phases. First, we did a deep dive of the threat environment, both current and future. And by deep, I mean deep. We spent weeks in four hour meetings a week going through it pretty much every classification level, what the what our potential adversaries are doing um, in developing threats that we either do or may require nuclear weapons to counter. Uh, second, we considered how that security environment shaped our assessment of the, what the roles of nuclear weapons should be in our national security strategy uh, and what our nuclear strategy should be to fulfill those roles. And then third, and only after having done threat and roles and strategy, uh, we took a hard look at what the requirements um, and capabilities uh, are that are needed to implement our strategy. Um, like most policy reviews in Washington, unfortunately, the focus of the 2022 nuclear posture review was primarily near term. While we obviously looked at how the threat environment was evolving in fairly great detail, the focus of the discussion about the roles of nuclear weapons in our strategy and the, our strategy itself did not emphasize addressing the future threat environment 
Rather, it focused on what the role of nuclear weapons should be in our strategy now and what our strategy should be now. And that is somewhat appropriate um, given that this is an administration making policy for the present. Uh, but I do lament a bit the fact that we didn't spend more time talking about what the implications were of an impending two peer threat environment, two nuclear peer threat environment for our strategy and our requirements, because as I'm gonna go into in greater detail later, uh, I think there's a fair amount of urgency to that question, given the state of our complex and our defense industrial base and our deployed force. But I'll go into that in detail later. Um, the discussion of what the roles of nuclear weapons should be and what our strategy should be uh, in the NPR resulted in a policy decision to state two key things that have been released so far from the administration. First, what, what the explicit roles of nuclear weapons are in US strategy, and second, what our declaratory policy is regarding the circumstances in which the United States might, which is an important part of our deterrent strategy, communicating the circumstances in which we might resort to the use of nuclear weapons. The nuclear policy, uh, nuclear posture review established that the explicit roles of US nuclear weapons are to, one, deter strategic attack. Note, it doesn't say nuclear attack, just strategic attack. It's nuclear attack, but isn't limited to it. Uh, deter strategic attack, assure our allies and partners, and achieve US objectives if deterrence fails. So three key roles of nuclear weapons in our strategy. The NPR also noted that the United States reaffirms a nuclear strategy that relies on nuclear weapons to deter all forms of strategic attack, not just nuclear attack. But the NPR does not define what a strategic attack is. So as I go through the rest of this talk, particularly when I'm talking about the uh, nature of the future threat we face and what the implications are of that, remember those three roles, deter strategic attack, assure allies and partners, and achieve US objectives if deterrence fails. The only change here from the explicit roles of nuclear weapons in the 2018 NPR is that the 2022 NPR dropped a role that was made explicit in the 2018 NPR, which was to hedge against an uncertain future security environment as an explicit role of our nuclear force. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about that change later if anyone's interested. Uh, regarding declaratory policy, again, the official statement regarding under what conditions the United States might use nuclear weapons, the 2022 nuclear posture review states, quote, the United States would only consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States or our allies and partners, unquote. This statement was the outcome of a fairly intense debate over months in which some advocated for a profound change in US declaratory policy that would have significantly reduced the role of nuclear weapons in US strategy, while others recommended continuity. Uh, continuity meaning continued calculated ambiguity regarding the circumstances in which we might use nuclear weapons to enhance deterrence. Um, again, I'm happy to answer questions later about the NPR process led to this simple restatement of the Obama administration's declaratory policy, because that sentence is a literal restatement of the Obama administration policy. Um, but for now, suffice it to say that strong opposition to a dramatic change in that declaratory policy from some elements of the Department of Defense and from US allies in particular, had a significant impact on the president's decision to re retain a measure of calculated ambiguity regarding the circumstances in which we might use nuclear weapons. Uh, and then let me just briefly mention one last issue that the administration has made public, um, despite not having yet released the unclassified NPR, and that's the sea launch nuclear or nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile or SLICM-N. The 2018 NPR had recommended two supplemental capabilities be added to the core Obama administration nuclear modernization program, specifically to enhance deterrence of adversary limited nuclear use. The first such capability was a low yield version of the W76 SLBM, which is now deployed, uh, SLBM warhead, uh, 
And the second capability was a new nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile, Slick MN. The 2022 NPR canceled the Slick MN program based on the argument that our existing and planned low yield capabilities are sufficient to deter adversary limited nuclear use and that Slick MN was too expensive in the context of the broader nuclear modernization program. Um, uh, let me just say that I disagreed with that decision, uh, as did the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and the reason that we disagreed uh, is rooted in the nature of the future threat environment that we face. So let's now move to a discussion of what we face in the midterm future, the mid 2030s. So for the entire history of the nuclear age, the United States has sized and structured its nuclear forces primarily to address the threat posed by Soviet and then Russian nuclear and conventional forces. Throughout that period, all the way to today, we have always had the luxury in this force sizing and structuring exercise of treating China's forces as what policy types in Washington call a lesser included threat. So let me give you an English translation of a lesser included threat. That meant that we believed that a nuclear force sufficient to deter or defeat Russian aggression was sufficient to also deter or defeat China, and that the nuclear force required to defeat China was small enough that we would retain the ability to deter Russia after a war with China. And the bad news that I'm bearing and that Brad is bearing uh, and that the intelligence community is bearing is that that will soon no longer be the case. China has embarked on a massive rapid expansion of its nuclear forces. That expansion has repeatedly exceeded the scope, scale, and schedule estimates of the U.S. intelligence community. For example, as recently as 2020, the Department of Defense assessed that China would double the size of its nuclear stockpile, then estimated to be in the low 200s, to something above 400 weapons within the decade by 2030. Since then, since 2020, China has accelerated its efforts and now is assessed to possibly possess up to 700 deliverable nuclear warheads by 2027, and they will likely have about 1,000 deliverable nuclear warheads by 2030. Not 400, 425, but 1,000 by 2030. Uh, and we don't believe they intend to stop there. Uh, and that's about as far as I can go on numbers estimates at the unclassified level. But the bottom line is that China will soon be a peer, not a near peer, a peer nuclear adversary of the United States. The ongoing rapid expansion of Chinese nuclear forces indicates that China has clearly decided one of two things. Either that the current role of nuclear weapons in their strategy requires a force far larger and more diverse than what they have today, or that the role of nuclear weapons in their strategy needs to change, and that that change requires a force far larger and more diverse than what they have today. We don't know which of these is true, but in either case, we're going to very soon face a Chinese nuclear force that can no longer be addressed as a mere lesser included case of the Russian nuclear threat. Instead, we will have to address it in combination with the Russian nuclear threat, and that is unprecedented. China's nuclear force expansion doesn't constitute simply an increase in the number of the weapons they are fielding. Several developments in Chinese force structure and posture deserve closer scrutiny. First, the Chinese are building a ballistic missile attack assessment capability and a command and control system that will enable them to adopt for the first time a launch under attack posture like that of the United States and Russia. This will make a Chinese silo-based ICBM force potentially survivable for the first time, just as they are massively increasing the size of that force, going from the high teens to the mid 300s in the number of silo-based ICBMs. Um, but unlike the US and Russia 
China has no experience in operating such a warning system tied directly to the ability to launch ICBMs before weapons dead. So that's a concern that as they go through a learning process, um, there could be significant danger there. Second, the Chinese are fielding a very large dual capable theater missile force with precision guidance capabilities that will enable the effective use of low yield nuclear warheads for the first time. So the second specific thing I wanted to talk to you about the Chinese developments are that the Chinese are fielding a very large dual capable theater missile force with precision guidance capabilities that will enable the effective use of low yield nuclear weapons by the Chinese military for the first time. This force will give them an array of limited theater nuclear options they've never had before. Options that are inconsistent, arguably, with their declared no first use minimum deterrence strategy, but options that would be consistent with Chinese adoption of a coercive limited use strategy similar to Russia's. Whether this constitutes a case of strategy pull or technology push, the fact is that China will have a force capable of supporting a very different nuclear strategy than they have traditionally proclaimed and exercised. Third, China recently flight tested a fractional orbital bombardment system that could also be made an orbital bombardment system. In the Cold War, the United States and Russia both abandoned such systems in part due to the destabilizing effects they can have in crisis or conflict. Such a system poses a potential decapitation threat to the US nuclear command and control system. The Chinese seem unconcerned about the strategic stability implications of a system even the Russians concluded was too dangerous. The China bottom line is this. While we don't know why they're doing it, China is aggressively seeking to achieve at least quantitative nuclear parity in deployed nuclear weapon systems with the United States. Again, this means that we will soon face two peer nuclear adversaries for the first time in the nuclear age. Now let's talk about the Russian nuclear threat for a few minutes. Now let's talk about the Russian threat. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Russia has a three part nuclear doctrine and strategy. The first part is to threaten an adversary with unacceptable damage in order to deter existential threats to the Russian state, particularly large scale nuclear threats. The second part is to initiate limited first use of nuclear weapons to coerce termination of an ongoing conventional war on terms acceptable to Russia. And that's a key term. We have concerns in the United States about what is meant by acceptable in this context. Does acceptable mean victory? If so, we have a problem. Part three is to conduct large scale nuclear operations against an adversary's conventional forces that pose a threat to the very existence of the Russian state. The first and third parts of what we know to be Russian strategy and doctrine are clearly stated in Russia's 2020 doctrinal decree. However, while that decree leaves room for the second part, coercive limited first use, it does not clearly state that this concept is an element of Russian strategy and doctrine, but we know that it is. And it is here at the point the Russians might consider limited first use of nuclear weapons to coerce war termination on ter terms acceptable to them that lies the interaction between US and Russian nuclear doctrine where the most serious potential for miscalculation and uncontrolled escalation resides. The concern is that this coercive limited use element of Russian doctrine grossly underestimates the stake of the United States in a conflict in which nuclear weapons are used against us or our allies. US strategy and doctrine does not contemplate capitulation in the wake of adversary use of nuclear weapons, limited or otherwise. Contrary to the apparent Russian perception that such use will intimidate us, limited use will instead dramatically raise the US state in the outcome of the conflict, making such capitulation less likely, not more likely. Our response to such use, whether it is intended to reestablish deterrence, limit further damage to the United States and our allies, or to achieve some other political military objective, will be designed to impose costs that exceed any gains Russia can achieve and deny them their objective. 
ultimately the interaction of U.S. strategy and doctrine with Russia's strategy and doctrine in the context of Russian coercive first use raises the question of how the U.S. assessment of best achievable terms, which is the term we use for what we seek for war termination, how best achievable terms compares to Russia's assessment of, quote, terms acceptable to Russia. If they are close to describing a similar conflict outcome, we might be able to avoid uncontrolled escalation of following limited first use. But if the Russians' definition of terms acceptable to Russia is not compatible with our assessment of best achievable terms, escalation is likely to continue, possibly resulting in uncontrolled escalation. So where does this leave us in addressing the threat posed by Russian strategy and doctrine and the nuclear force that they have built and continue to expand to enable that strategy and doctrine? In my view, it leaves the president under our planned nuclear force modernization with too few flexible response options to credibly threaten the Russians with the denial of their objectives and the imposition of costs that exceed what they can achieve. Russian non-strategic nuclear forces are designed to enable a Russian strategy that envisions a war fighting role for nuclear weapons to compensate for their non-nuclear inferiority vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Given the performance of Russian conventional forces in Ukraine, can anyone imagine Russia reducing the role of nuclear weapons in their strategy in the near future? The bottom line is the Russia part of our two-peer nuclear challenge is likely to get worse, not better, between now and the mid-2030s. Now let's turn to the unique challenge posed by facing these two, near, uh, uh, two nuclear peers for the first time in the nuclear age. Again, let's establish the historical context. While we've always faced the potential of war with Russia and China simultaneously, China's nuclear forces were always a lesser included case of the Russia threat. Remember, that meant that we believed the nuclear force sufficient to deter or defeat Russian aggression was sufficient to deter or defeat China, and that the nuclear force required to defeat China was small enough that we would retain the ability to deter Russia after a war with China. When China approaches quantitative and qualitative nuclear parity with the United States, however, that will no longer be the case. So how does this two nuclear peer challenge differ from what we've faced in the past? I believe it takes two primary forms, and this is not just nuclear strategy, but to national security strategy. Uh, one form is that we need to find a way to deter or defeat opportunistic aggression in a second theater while engaged in a large scale conflict with the other adversary in the first theater is being able to deter or defeat aggression that happens simultaneously and in concert. In a two nuclear peer environment, the role of nuclear weapons in US strategy may need to change, in my opinion, and not in the direction of further reducing the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy. Let me just kind of simply walk you through kind of what the sort of grand strategic alternatives. So one, if we and our allies are able, so in a two nuclear peer environment, the role of nuclear weapons in US strategy may need to change. And in my view, not in the direction of further reducing their role in our strategy. So let me walk you through sort of the two logic chains of what our grand strategy might encompass. Um, first, if we and our allies are able to field sufficient non-nuclear forces to fight and win in two theaters against two nuclear peers simultaneously, then there might be no need to change the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy from what it is today. But what if we can't afford to field sufficient non-nuclear forces to do that? If the credibility of our combat forces being able to win a war is central to the effectiveness of our integrated deterrence concept, as senior DOD officials have repeatedly said, should the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy remain the same as it is today in the two nuclear peer world we will soon face? I don't think it should. And let me give you an example of what I mean by a changed role. 
Today, we don't rely on U.S. nuclear weapons to counter adversary conventional superiority because no single adversary is conventionally superior to the United States and its allies. But in a two nuclear peer environment, we may face conventional inferiority in a second theater of major power war. If we cannot or will not afford conventional forces capable of fighting Russia and China simultaneously, should we simply admit that we're going to lose in the second theater, or should we take steps to increase our reliance on nuclear weapons to counter opportunistic or coordinated second theater aggression? Let me point out that this change would not require going beyond the 2022 NPR's three ex explicit roles for nuclear weapons, deter adversary strategic attack, assure allies, and achieve our objectives if deterrence fails. But it would mean accepting a role for U.S. nuclear weapons in countering adversary conventional superiority in a second theater, whether due to opportunistic aggression or coordinated aggression. And it would also mean that our strategy would place new deterrence and warfighting demands on our nuclear forces that our current forces would be, in my opinion, very hard pressed to credibly meet. So now let's briefly discuss the U.S. nuclear force requirements implications of the two-peer nuclear threat and the operational implications of countering it. I believe there are two key force requirements questions the two-peer threat forces on us, and I believe it is forcing on us these questions on us with some urgency. First, the force sizing requirement the two-peer nuclear threat creates will depend largely on whether our strategy requires counterforce targeting of both Russian and Chinese nuclear forces simultaneously. The counterforce targeting element of US nuclear strategy is the single largest driver of the size of the force required to implement that strategy. The two nuclear peer strategy debate that we need to have, and that in my opinion, we did not have during the 2022 NPR, must include a debate over the need for counterforce targeting to deter aggression and escalation and to restore deterrence and or limit damage if deterrence fails. This counterforce targeting question was not a simple question in a one-peer environment, but it is far more complicated in a two-peer environment. So we need to ask ourselves, what are the deterrence, assurance, and achieve objectives implications of only being able to conduct comprehensive counterforce strikes against one peer adversary's nuclear forces? The second key requirements question is what US forces are necessary to deter adversary limited nuclear use during a theater war. When the two peer threat arrives, both Russia and China will have very significant theater nuclear forces. Theater forces far in excess of what the US and its allies currently plan to have. We know the central role of those forces in Russian strategy, and we can form hypotheses about their role in future Chinese strategy. Those roles don't paint a reassuring picture. In my view, the United States will need expanded theater nuclear capabilities in both Europe and Asia to enhance deterrence of limited nuclear use, whether it is intended to coerce us into war termination on the adversary's terms or to defeat us militarily. In my view, strategic nuclear forces alone are insufficiently flexible and timely to convince an adversary that the United States is prepared to counter limited first use and deter or counter further limited escalation with militarily effective nuclear responses of our own. Deterrence of limited nuclear first use is not the place, in my opinion, to take risk. Limited nuclear escalation is widely agreed to be the most likely path to uncontrolled escalation that poses an existential threat to the United States. This is why I've been a strong supporter of Slickham N as the single best option for providing such survivable theater capability at relatively low cost, in sufficient quantities, in a manner likely to be welcomed by our European and Asian allies, and on a threat relevant schedule to address potential Russian and Chinese limited first use of nuclear weapons. We looked very hard during the 2018 NPR at alternatives, and we found that no other system can check all those boxes that I just described given where we are in our planned modernization, 
Let me shift now to talking about what are the implications of this future threat environment for the DOE nuclear enterprise. Um, in my view, we need to urgently address this question regarding our strategy for a two-peer nuclear threat environment, a question that, again, the 22 NPR unfortunately did not address despite my best efforts. Here's the fact we must face and face now. If our strategy for that two-peer environment requires a larger nuclear force or a structurally different nuclear force or both a larger and a structurally different nuclear force, we pretty much need to know that now or in the next few years. And this urgency in determining uh, the answer to that question really exists for two reasons. Uh, the first is that we delayed the modernization of our existing nuclear force for so long that we now must replace the entire force essentially just in time to avoid our current force aging out before it can be replaced. This just-in-time approach makes it difficult to increase the size of the U.S. nuclear force in a timely way. Let me just give you a couple of examples of why that's the case. So, for example, every new Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine we put to sea will replace an Ohio-class SSBN that is no longer operationally functional. We currently plan to field 12 Columbia ballistic missile submarines. We can't field a 13th such boat if we find we need it until 2042 at the earliest, unless we build a new shipyard capable of building SSBNs, which would be a massive investment that would also need to be made very soon to enable the construction of more ballistic missile submarines earlier than 2042. To make matters worse, for every Columbia SSN, SSBN we field, we lose an Ohio-class SSBN that actually has four to eight more missile launch tubes than the Columbia that replaces it. In other words, fielding the Columbia class builds down the number of available launchers in the planned ballistic missile submarine force from the 240 deployed launchers we have today under New Start to 192 deployed launchers when Columbia is fully fielded. We face a similar problem if we were to conclude that we need to either increase the size of the ICBM force or alter its basing mode in the face of two potential peer preemptive counterforce threats. If we're going to build more silos or build mobile ICBM garrisons and launchers and support equipment, we pretty much need to know that now. And if we conclude that our two peer nuclear strategy requires additional theater nuclear capabilities, as, as I believe it does, capabilities like the Silicon Men or intermediate range ground launch systems. The threat timeline requires that we get started in, on designing and fielding such systems in the next few years as well. So that's kind of the, the driver of urgency from the state of our force modernization plans. Uh, but, but there's a second source of urgency in addressing this two-peer strategy question. And that is the result of our post-Cold War belief that the role of nuclear weapons in international security affairs would fade away over time. This led us to fail to modernize the DOE nuclear weapons design and production infrastructure in a timely way, and to fail to ensure that DOE weapons infrastructure had a prudent level of surplus capacity in case our prediction regarding the future proved inadequate. So the first source of urgency in determining what our strategy will be for the two-peer uh, environment is that we are in a just-in-time modernization program that simply is designed to replace our existing force. Uh, and increasing the size of the force is difficult uh, for the reasons I described. But there's a second source of urgency uh, regarding making this decision about our strategy for what we'll do in a two-peer environment. And that is the result of our post-Cold War belief that the role of nuclear weapons in international security affairs would fade away over time. This belief led us to fail to modernize the DOE nuclear weapons design and production infrastructure in a timely way, and to fail to ensure 
that DOE weapons infrastructure had a prudent level of surplus capacity in case our prediction regarding the future security environment proved inaccurate, which it did. As a result, the existing DOE nuclear weapons infrastructure, in my view, is severely challenged to simply support the planned modernization program that basically replaces the force we have. And remember, because we're fielding new systems just in time, warhead delays in the planned modernization program threaten to re result in the actual loss of deployed nuclear capability, not just a delay in fielding a new capability because the outgoing systems will wear out and we, they won't be usable. If our modernization program needs to be expanded in numbers, types, or both to support our future two nuclear peer strategy, we face a dire challenge. We must begin adjusting the warhead modernization program and the capacity of its enabling infrastructure now if we are to be able to field a larger or more diverse force before China's rapid expansion results in us facing two nuclear peers. The bottom line is the United States faces a potential unconstrained nuclear arms competition with two peer adversaries who did not neglect their nuclear weapons infrastructure and have no intention of reducing the role of nuclear weapons in their national security strategies. Yet our nuclear weapons design and production infrastructure capacity is inadequate to engage in such an unconstrained competition effectively, in my view. What incentive will Russia and China have to engage in serious nuclear arms control negotiations, for example, if they know they can simply outcompete us in fielding forces capable of the highest level of violence? So here's where you come in. The the excellent technical personnel of, of the DOE infrastructure and enterprise. The US nuclear weapons labs and their supporting production infrastructure were the core of the nation's ability to face down the Soviet Union in the Cold War. But both then operated under a very different culture and rule set, a culture designed for intense competition and a rule set adjusted to take reasonable operational risk in the face of far greater geopolitical risk. So what do we need you in the labs to do? Well, I believe we need cultural and technical innovation to enable the United States to compete effectively in this future two-peer threat environment. We need to be able to design new nuclear weapons that put significantly less strain on the DOE nuclear weapons infrastructure because they are easier, cheaper, and faster to build. We need to field warheads on more than one delivery system to reduce the strain on the infrastructure of having to maintain so many different designs while maintaining sufficient diversity to hedge against technical failure. We need to rediscover the need to take prudent risks in the DOE nuclear enterprise. And this is probably going to be a little controversial, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Should we be imposing risk mitigation measures that require the risk of a single incident be far less likely than the risk of nuclear war itself in any given year? Are we more afraid of one injury than millions of deaths? No, we can't determine the precise probability of a nuclear war in any, in any given year. But if that risk were say one in a hundred million would we be spending hundreds of billions of dollars to prevent it? I believe we need to relook at our risk tolerance across the, the enterprise. The science-based stockpile stewardship achievements of NNSA and the labs have been phenomenal, don't get me wrong. You were given a task and you, and you achieved it. You were told to maintain the current force without nuclear testing and make sure that it was safe, secure, and effective, and you've done that. But in this new environment, stockpile stewardship alone is unlikely to be enough. We need a nuclear weapons enterprise that can once again successfully compete, this time with two well-resourced and technically sophisticated peer adversaries. So look, don't just take my word for this. I urge you all to do your own research on the nature of the impending two-peer threat environment, classified and unclassified. Uh, 
I recommend you read Brad's excellent monograph on the need for a blue theory of victory, which also describes in some detail Russia and China's red theories of victory. See for yourselves if what Dr. Roberts and I are telling you about the future threat environment and what it will demand of us is true. All of us in the US national security community need to ask ourselves about the future role of nuclear weapons in our strategy and the force required to implement that strategy. So question number one, what is the strategic rationale for believing that the modernized nuclear force we planned in 2010 before Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2014 and 2022, and before China's ongoing race to nuclear parity, will be sufficient to address a 2030 security environment in which we face two peer nuclear adversaries who are increasingly politically and strategically aligned. Question number two is, what would it cost the United States and our allies to build sufficient non-nuclear forces to deter and defeat both Russia and China simultaneously? And are we likely to decide to bear that cost? And then my third question is, why would a nuclear weapons design and production infrastructure designed to just barely be able to maintain our existing nuclear forces be sufficient to provide what we will require in a security environment in which we face unconstrained nuclear competition with two peer nuclear adversaries who are both technically sophisticated and well-resourced. I think those are the central questions we face. And I kind of indicated what I think the answer to those questions is, but uh, let me thank you for your attention and your patience. That was a, that was a long diatribe uh, and I'm very eager to answer your questions. Thanks, Greg, that was, that was great. Uh, thank you for the kind plug for my monograph. Um, <laughs> it is excellent. Thank you. Uh